Did you know that the new Israeli state almost destroyed itself five weeks after it was founded? How did civil war threaten the new nation before Israel's 1948 war of independence was even over? Let's talk about the infamous Altalena affair. On a bright sunny summer day in Tel Aviv, Jewish soldiers in the newly formed Israeli army opened fire on a Jewish ship, the Altalena, killing other Jewish fighters and ultimately blowing up the ship, which had been carrying thousands of weapons and ammunition meant for the Israeli War of Independence. I know what you're thinking. How could this possibly happen? And how was Israel able to pull back from the brink of self-destruction? Before we get into these questions, let's take a step back. Remember, until May 1948, there was no state of Israel, so there was no official Israeli army. Instead, pre-state Israel was controlled by the British under the British Mandate of Palestine. In response to Arab riots and pogroms against the Jews in the 1920s and 30s, the Jewish community founded an underground defense militia called the Haganah, or defense. In order to avoid British restrictions, the Haganah exercised a policy of restraint, being careful to defend Jews from Arab violence, but never counterattack or preempt. Sounds simple enough, right? Not really. There were other Jews who, believe it or not, didn't really agree. These other Jews weren't in love with this policy of restraint. And because there was no Jewish state yet, and no official army, they felt no need to obey the decisions of the Haganah. So they established their own underground military organization called Irgun Tzva'i Leomi, the National Military Organization, or the Irgun for short. And the Irgun had no problem taking a more aggressive role against the Arabs' effort to prevent a Jewish state, and even carried out attacks against the British, who weren't exactly welcomed by either side. Jump forward to 1939 during World War II. With the Nazis on the rise, it was clear that the danger to millions of European Jews was severe and imminent. And at this time, the British chose to issue the White Paper, a policy limiting Jewish immigration to Palestine and ultimately preventing the escape of hundreds of thousands of Jews from the Nazis. So while the British were fighting the Nazis, they were also preventing Jewish refugees from immigrating to Palestine. It comes as no surprise that the Haganah, led by Ben-Gurion, and the Irgun, led by Menachem Begin, disagreed on how to deal with this dilemma. These two leaders would be the main players in the upcoming Altalena disaster, which we'll get to in a minute. The Irgun eventually chose to continue to fight the British because of their restrictive immigration policy, while the Haganah tried to cooperate with the British, both in fighting the Nazis and in curbing the activities of the Irgun, despite the British immigration policy. During a tragic period in 1944 called the hunting season, the Haganah even arrested members of the Irgun and handed them over to the British, knowing full well that they might be hanged. This just shows the magnitude of the Haganah's fear that the Irgun attacks were putting their cooperative relationship with the British in jeopardy, threatening the very existence of a future state. However, once World War II ended in 1945 and the British showed no sign of easing immigration restrictions, the Haganah decided to join the Irgun's revolt against the British. Then, in 1947, the big day arrived. The United Nations voted to partition the land into one Jewish state, which the Jews accepted, and one Arab state, which the Arabs declined. So in May 1948, the British threw up their hands and said, cheerio, and left the Jews and Arabs to duke it out. That same day, Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of the State of Israel. Now that Israel was officially a state, there could only be one army, and so the underground Haganah morphed into the Israel Defense Forces, also known as the IDF. The much smaller Irgun, led by Menachem Begin, agreed to be absorbed into the ranks of the IDF, although they remained in distinct Irgun battalions within the army. There was still a huge amount of distrust between the two groups, and in this toxic environment, armed conflict against each other was not only likely, but almost inevitable. And now, finally, let's get back to the Altalena. A month into the war, the UN brokered a ceasefire between the Arab and Israeli forces, and one of the conditions was that no new arms could be brought in during the ceasefire. This put Israel, which was very short on weapons and ammunition, at a slight disadvantage when facing an assortment of armies from the surrounding Arab states, intent on wiping it off the face of the earth. And it is now that the long-standing tensions between the Haganah and the Irgun resurfaced, culminating in the Altalena affair. The same day the UN ceasefire was announced, an Irgun boat in France, who had their own power struggle with the British, set sail for Israel. Oh, and this boat was packed with thousands of guns and millions of bullets meant for Israel's fight for independence, along with 940 future soldiers and immigrants. Begin hadn't given the order to set sail, and when he found out about this snafu, he alerted the Haganah, not wanting to appear as if he were undermining Ben-Gurion's command. Begin wanted to land the ship in Tel Aviv, but Ben-Gurion feared that this violation of the ceasefire would be too obvious. Instead, he preferred to land the ship in Kfar Vitkin, a few miles north away from prying eyes. Oh, and an area that was also deeply committed to the Haganah side of the political divide. Or not. See, 
There is a lot of confusion around the events of the Altalena, and it's not totally clear whether the landing was approved by Ben-Gurion or went against his orders. Begin agreed, but was adamant that 80% of the weapons would be distributed to Irgun battalions within the IDF. The other 20%, he wanted to give to the Irgun's Jerusalem Battalion, which operated independently, having never been absorbed into the IDF. And he felt that this was a perfectly reasonable request. But to Ben-Gurion, arming thousands of Irgunist soldiers loyal to Begin didn't sound like the best idea. There could only be one army with one central command, and Ben-Gurion took Begin's request as insubordinate at best and treasonous at worst. The distrust between them was so deep that Ben-Gurion feared that Begin might be planning a military coup. The Altalena finally anchored off the coast of Farvitkin. Some passengers disembarked and joined the IDF, while other Irgun members began to unload the cargo. And this is where things went south. Ben-Gurion, sending instructions to his officers at Farvitkin, ordered Begin to hand over all of the cargo to the Haganah immediately with no preconditions, and warned Begin that he was surrounded by IDF troops. Begin refused to acknowledge the ultimatum. It may not have occurred to him that Ben-Gurion considered him a danger to the state. Instead, he assumed that this was the usual bluster and tried to negotiate. In this confusing and tense atmosphere, shots were fired. We don't know who fired or why, but within minutes, there was an open firefight between the Haganah and the Irgun. Begin fled to the ship on a rowboat while under fire. Once on board, he directed the Altalena to rush along the coast towards Tel Aviv, hoping to speak directly with Ben-Gurion. On the beach were dead and wounded soldiers from both sides. Rumors spread, and former Irgun members started leaving their posts. Civil war was now a real possibility. The Altalena exchanged fire with IDF warships, eventually running aground off the coast of Tel Aviv. In full view of anyone strolling down the boardwalk, IDF soldiers, led by Haganah commanders Yigal Alon and future Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, opened fire on the Irgunists. Begin ordered his men not to fire even if fired upon, but in the fog of battle, his orders weren't followed. Ben-Gurion gave the order to fire a cannon at the Altalena and sink it at sea. The Irgunists abandoned ship just as the ammunition on board exploded, sending the Altalena to the bottom of the sea. All told, 16 Irgunists and three Haganah soldiers were killed in the battle. Irgunists were rounded up and the IDF soldiers who refused to fire on fellow Jews were court-martialed. Begin, who escaped arrest, went on the radio and demanded that his followers not fight the IDF, declaring, quote, a war between brothers, never. Some historians credit Begin with preventing civil war. Although, to be fair, he was also the guy who almost started one to begin with. Begin himself considered averting civil war to be his life's greatest accomplishment. However, to Ben-Gurion, his own success in establishing the integrity of one army and the sovereignty of Israel as one unified state was the greatest thing to come from the Altalena affair. As a result of the affair, there would no longer be distinct Irgun battalions within the IDF. In any case, most people consider the Altalena affair to have been a tragedy that could have been avoided, fueled by the strong personalities of two of Israel's greatest leaders, both of whom made mistakes. In fact, the enmity between the two leaders remained deep after the war, and although they eventually made peace, the animosity between their followers persisted through the decades and can even be seen in the divide between what has become the left and the right in Israeli politics today. But how should we view the Altalena affair? It remains controversial, maybe because it seems so paradoxical. Did the tragedy further divide Israeli society? Or by coming so close to civil war and then averting it, did the events strengthen and ultimately unify the elements of Israeli society? Or was it a little of both? Leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe.